Okay, I will start. Okay, good morning, afternoon, evening. Hola, hello, bonjour. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, annyeonghaseyo, and hello all. And welcome and thank you for joining us the 46th seminar, and I call it a uh, dark party. And I just came back from San Francisco where I met many people for the first time in person or did catch up after many years of no meeting or virtual meetings. And at least for the next two weeks, I will not have any seminar or conference trip uh, after I finish 70 days of my crazy uh, seminar trip. So, okay, it's my tremendous honor to introduce very briefly our pioneer speaker, Dr. Linda Christie. She does not need any introduction. She is a DAPA BTO program director and manager and recently started a very interesting program to utilize biological systems to extract rare earth elements from environments. She is a, one of the longest supporters and visionary person of synthetic biologists uh, as a ONR Symbio program manager for many, many, many years, and now DAPAR program manager. In fact, I especially thank her for her support of my ONR Young Investigator program, and now the DAPAR project for many teams. And especially I got my ONR award when I need any grant the most, I mean, just before my tenure evaluation. And since then, I received 15 grants for five years with the almost $9 million to my lab and more than $30 million to entire my team. So I would say she's my lucky charm. And <laughs> so I really thank her. Uh, so Linda, thanks so much for your time and long time commitment to this synthetic biology community. I wish you continue to do so, and we are all grateful. So virtual podium is all yours now. Thank you so much. Well, uh, hello everyone, and thank you, Taysuk, for the very kind introduction, as well as for organizing this um, really impactful and exciting synthetic biology young speaker series and for inviting me to say a few words to the community today. As you mentioned, it's been my privilege to be a government research program manager for over 20 years at the Office of Naval Research or ONR, and for the past two years at the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency or DARPA. And as you alluded to, for much of that time, my programs have focused on developing new tools and chassis for microbial engineering, and relevant to today's talk, um, I had a particular interest and focus in electroactive bacteria and in taking those unique organisms and orienting them towards sense and actuate functionalities. My inspiration in this area was driven by a very longstanding interest in environmental microbiology, microbial fuel cells, and microbial electrochemical systems. And while those programs were oriented towards environmental energy harvesting, like generating electricity to power devices, from that research and the great people that were supported by the program, we've gained at least an initial understanding of extracellular electron transport, or EET, systems that are used by bacteria like Geobacter and Schuonella. Now, they use this extracellular electron transport functionality naturally in the environment to interact with substrates like iron oxides. But as our program and others uh, discovered, they would also interact with anthropogenic substrates like electrodes. And this was the source of you know, being able to harvest electricity from these microbes. So EET is at the same time a simple phenomenon and a really complicated one in that there are many, many different mechanisms biomolecules and structures uh, that are involved, and they depend really seriously on the organisms, the specific organisms, and what niche they occupy in an environment. Uh, and interestingly, although a lot of the early work focused on looking for these organisms and understanding the, um, the, uh, the electron transport in 
environments outside of the human body, these organisms has all, have also been found in the gut. And what they're doing there, you know, pretty interesting. So as the understanding of the various mechanisms, component parts, and operating conditions for EET was emerging, a natural next step that I, I'm probably not the only one to have thought of this, but was to take these electroactive organisms and develop genetic tools for their manipulation and to figure out how to exploit this electron transfer process. So I like to think of this as synthetic electrobiology, so maybe a subset of SynBio. Uh, and it was the focus of several research efforts that I supported towards the end of my time at ONR. The kinds of things that we were asking the community to think about was like, could you develop ways to use electrical current as an on-off switch for bacterial genetic circuits? You know, playing on the analogies that the electrical engineering people, you know, like to develop when they talk about synthetic biology and the programmability, but thinking of literally an on-off switch that uses electrical current is, is pretty neat. Or maybe electrical current is a new type of output signal. Again, if you want to interface uh, living organisms with more conventional types of platforms, uh, and a lot of folks who work in the bioelectronics area related to medicine are, are thinking about how to do that. How do you have living microbes communicate with other types of electronic devices? Can you engineer microbes to develop or generate uh, nanowires to conduct electricity as part of electrical circuits and, and be integrated into an electrical, uh, an electronic device? So there's lots of interesting directions that this area of research can take, but key to accomplishing that is learning how to domesticate these interesting organisms and really understand their component parts. So this is a perfect setup for today's young speaker, Josh Atkinson, as he is trained with several of the leading scientists working to engineer electroactive bacteria or to utilize their component parts. And I, I'm talking about people like Carolyn Aho Franklin and Josh Silberg and Mo El Nagar. Um, I had the pleasure of supporting those labs to work on synthetic electrobiology efforts uh, through the ONR programs, and actually first met Josh when he was a graduate student working with Josh Silberg at Rice. So I am super excited to hear his talk today, as I know he's been working on some really exciting projects in this synthetic electrobiology space. Thank you for listening to my short talk, and I know you're going to enjoy Josh's talk way more. So thank you. A wonderful, wonderful introduction for the talk. And my vision or my dream is one day I drive my car, and my car is driven by bacteria generating electricity, and or you know my computer and my cell phone in the same way. So that's someday. Uh, not tomorrow, but yeah, thank you. That's brilliant. I, I love it. Okay, so um, now the main speaker of today with a longer introduction. And Dr. Josh Atkins is an NSF postdoctoral fellow in biology working at the University of Southern California in the Department of Physics and Astronomy. And I just heard Joshi will be moving to Denmark. And actually, I you know, visited Denmark to give a seminar. That is such a nice, interesting country and then very strong scientific community. So I you know, basically congrat, and then I, I will say good luck. And Joshi's research bridge approach from synthetic biology, protein engineering, and electrochemistry, very unique kind of combination, I would say, to study and engineer biological charge transport within cells, communities, and at biotic and abiotic interfaces. So his postdoctoral work is focused on building synthetic multicellular microbial communities that can use long distance electron transfer to couple spatially separated metabolic reactions uh, as the Linda already kind of uh, indicated. Before joining USC, Josh obtained a PhD, PhD in systems and synthetic uh, and physical biology from Rice University in Houston, Texas. There, he worked using library approaches to build ligand-gated protein switches to post 
translationally controlled electron transfer reactions in living cells. Josh spent part of his PhD as a Department of Energy SCGSR fellow at Lawrence Berkeley Rational Labs Molecular Foundry. And there he also worked to engineer E. coli into bioelectronic sensors that use protein switches to control extracellular electron transfer with electrodes. So with that, you know, history and expertise or experience, I believe he will be perfect person to implement my dream, you know, my car basically done by bacteria and bacteria generate electricity for my car. So Josh, thank you so much and please take it away. It's my great honor to have you and Linda today. Thank you for that introduction, Taysuk. Let me get the slides up. Okay, everybody see that? Good, nice. Um, well, I, good morning, and I'd like to start off just thanking Taysuk for creating uh, this seminar series in this new community uh, and giving people opportunities to speak uh, virtually. It's a, been a really nice thing to watch over the pandemic times and going forward. And I really want to thank Linda for that really inspirational talk and kind of history of uh, this field focusing on microbial electronics, um, which is really the space that I like to work in. And as Linda mentioned, my work's been focused on interfacing living organisms with electronic devices. And today I'm going to tell you how I'm using synthetic biology and protein engineering approaches to build these types of living electronics. So life is inherently electrical in nature. Um, cells can control the movement of ions, protons, and electrons to facilitate things like multicellular communication, like you see in neurons and some biofilms, but as well as to extract and store energy from their environment. And I'm really interested in the diverse approaches that uh, life has been using to control the movement of electrons uh, within cells for met metabolic purposes. And I'm really interested in trying to leverage these types of approaches to build new types of living electronic components. So these are things like capacitors or transistors or diodes that are actually built out of living cells or proteins. Um, but as well as things like photovoltaic cells, uh, spin filters, or sensors that can respond to chemicals that really leverage some of the, the real unique properties that life has um, for converting light to energy, for biasing the flow of electrons dependent on their spin, as well as to responding to chemicals out in the environment, which is something cells are really especially good at um, relative to conventional electronics. Um, but in order to do this, uh, we need to get really a better understanding of the fundamental electrical properties, just like Linda was mentioning, um, and the length scales and uh, currents at which they can actually operate. So as you can see here, uh, different biomolecules and cells um, are capable of transporting electrons over many orders of magnitude, magnitude of different spatial lengths. Um, and gaining a better understanding of what the limitations of each of these components are will help us enable uh, interfacing these with abiotic materials like electrodes. Um, so today I'm gonna to tell you two different stories. Uh, one of these stories is from my postdoc work here at USC with Moel Najjar, uh, where we've been building conductive living uh, materials. Um, and then the other story is from my PhD work uh, with Joff Silberg, where we were building living electronic sensors and collaborating with uh, Carolyn Ajo Franklin to get these to produce electrical outputs so we could directly monitor these sensors with electronics. So the first of these stories that I'm going to go into is this conductive living materials. So as Linda mentioned earlier, there are uh, a few different model um, electroactive organisms, and one of these is Shiwanella onodensis. Um, and so this is the organism that I work with. And over here on the left, you can see it colonizing an iron oxide particle. Uh, so these are gram-negative bacteria that live in aquatic sediments, and they really like to live at abiotic or uh, ox anoxic interfaces. And the thing that makes them somewhat unique is their ability to respire off of insoluble substrates. So you can see here, these cells are growing on this rock and they're actually able to use this rock to power their metabolism. And it's because they're able to interact with these insoluble substrates that they're also able to in interact with uh, anthropogenic uh, uh, substrates like uh, electrodes. So over here on the right, what I'm showing you is a glass slide as well as an indium tin oxide electrode. 
And the neat thing that these cells can do is they can actually gain energy from this electrode when they're growing on them. So as you can see here, uh, when you poise this electrode at a favorable potential, these cells are able to generate a proton motive force and save some energy, which you can see here by their increase in this green color when we use a membrane voltage dye to monitor them. And the reason the cells are able to do this is because they've evolved a few different strategies for transporting electrons across different length scales. Um, so one of the things that makes Shiwanella as well as Geobacter unique is that they've evolved ways to transport electrons past their insulating outer membrane. This is really a challenge that you have to overcome to interact with an insoluble substrate. And the way that they do this is they use what are called multiheme cytochromes. So these are proteins that are embedded in their outer membrane that have a series of C-type uh, hemes bound to this protein that enable electrons to hop across this nanoscale barrier and move outside of the cell and ultimately deposit these electrons on either a rock or an electrode that they're interacting with. And then these multiheme cytochromes are actually capable of diffusing across the membrane of the cell, allowing them to traverse the entire surface of the cell and exchange electrons with neighboring cytochromes as well as with neighboring cells. So as you can see here, when you label these cytochromes with a quantum dot, you can actually see them moving along what in this case is a membrane extension connecting these two blue cells. Um, and that enables electrons to be transported over micron length scales up to about the length of a cell or so. Um, and these cells can also come together and form communities in biofilms that can enable them to transport electrons beyond the length of a single cell and actually transport multiple cell lengths away. So what you're seeing here is a smattering of cells here that are in red that are covering a gap between two sets of electrodes, which are these kind of light colors here. And these cells are capable of transporting electrons from one electrode band to the other on the order of 10 to 30 microns along, um, even though these cells themselves are only about three to five microns long themselves. And so we were really interested in seeing if we could take these electroactive bacteria that grow in these kind of amorphous biofilms uh, to do their business and turn them into something that's more of a programmable living electronic material that we could try to build circuits out of. And so in order to do this, we turn to uh, optogenetics um, to guide how biofilms form on surfaces. Um, so um, this was a collaboration with uh, Dr. Fengji Zhao and Marco Chavez, who are in the Bodeker and El Najar labs here at USC. And uh, what they started off doing was taking CDRA and CDRB, which are these surface adhesin proteins that are produced by Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and place them under control of a blue light inducible promoter system. In this case, it's that PDON system that um, many people are familiar with. And what happens with the system is when you shine blue light on it, these CDRAB proteins are expressed inside of the cell, and it causes the cells to become sticky and adhere to one another, but also adhere to surfaces like electrodes that we might expose them to. So we can use simple lithographic approaches where we shine light through a photo mask to guide biofilm formation onto surfaces. Um, and uh, one of the first things that uh, they tried to print was uh, our funding agency's name. So again, Linda, thank you for the funding of the multi-university research initiative that really started this work. Um, so they printed off ONR's uh, name there. Um, but the one thing that we tend to do with this patterning system is to build things that are more like rectangles and function more like uh, current carriers like you would have in electrical circuits. And the nice thing you can do here is you can actually control the size and location of these biofilms onto electrode surfaces. So you can see here we have a very large biofilm, a medium, and a small biofilm. And the reason why we do this is because it's challenging to get these cells to grow on electrodes in the way that you want so that you can start to measure their fundamental characteristics. So in order to really uh, ask the question of how conductive is a Shiwanella biofilm, what we did was we used lithography to print these biofilms onto what are known as interdigitated electrodes. So these are sets of source and drain electrodes that you can see here in gray and black that form these interdigitated fingers um, that meet together. And what this does is it creates sets of insulating gaps that you can try to drive current across through a biofilm. Um, so this is an image of one of our actual IDAs that we make. So we make these out of indium tin oxide, which is a transparent electrode material. So you're seeing a schematic here of how we printed the ITO. And then over here, you're seeing an actual image of that. So you can't actually see the ITO because it's transparent. Um, and then we uh, shine that blue light to get our biofilm to form right over this interdigitated area. And then in order to measure the conductivity, we have to do some electrochemistry here. 
Um, so the way that we do these measurements is that we perform what's known as cyclic voltammetry. So when you do this type of measurement, what you do is you take your working electrode, which in this case is a source and a drain, and you change its potential over time. So we're going from a negative potential about minus 300 millivolts up to about positive 500 millivolts, and then we cycle that back down. And what you get out as a, a readout is the current that's flowing out, out of and into this biofilm over time as you're changing that potential. So as you can see here, when we have the source and the drain moving together with the same potential, you get this a CV scan, as we'll call them, uh, that look exactly like one another, where you have this peak, which is around the formal potential of these multi-heme cytochromes out in the outer membrane of these cells. And then when you take the difference of these two, the source and the drain, you get this flat line here. There isn't any conduction happening between the source electrode and the drain electrode. And that's because we've not provided a driving force or an offset voltage between these two electrodes. So when we do start to have an offset voltage, so if we shift that to about 60 millivolts that I'm showing you here, the drain is more positive and there's a favorable uh, driving force to have electrons flow from the source through the biofilm into the drain. And this will happen between every set of fingers on this electrode. Um, and as you can see here, this dramatically changes the CV scan that we get out from these cells. So instead of these being perfect overlays of one another, you see this drain shift up and have more current and this source be suppressed and have less current. And then when you take these differences here, you can actually see the conduction current, as we call it, flowing through this biofilm. And it's centered right at that formal potential of the multi-heme cytochrome. So this is indicating that these multi-heme cytochromes are functioning as the electrical conduit in this biofilm for enabling this electron transport to happen. Um, so this can show that we can get conductance through this biofilm, but what we're really interested in measuring here is actually the intrinsic material property of this biofilm, which would be its conductivity. So this is a value that you can actually scale with the size of the biofilm as you make different sized biofilms, and you can use to inform patterning and in building out new types of electrical circuits. So in order to do that, we made a few different measurements with different offset potentials. So you can see here, we went from 10 millivolts up to 60 millivolts. And as you increase that driving force for electron flow, you get an increase in the conductance that's happening. Um, and then we just wanted to check that this is nice and we're in a linear regime where the uh, conductance is responding linearly to the offset voltage. And then you can use this nice system of equations to solve for what the conductivity of this biofilm is. So what we're doing is we're taking these peak currents, this uh, I conductivity, um, which is equal to a conductance value multiplied by this offset voltage. And the thing, this conductance value um, is, is both the intrinsic conductivity, so the sigma here, as well as a geometric parameter that depends on the geometry of your electrodes, as well as the biofilm that's growing on top of it. So we have a, a, about a 300 centimeter long insulating gap that weaves between these with a, fit, a 30 micron gap between these two electrodes. Um, and then our biofilm is about 10 micrometers thick. And with that, you're able to solve for the conductivity of this biofilm and show that in this case, these wild type Shiwanella biofilms that have been engineered uh, to be lithographically printed have conductivities on the order of two to four nanosiemens per centimeter. But what we really want to do is see if we can take these biofilms and turn them into something like semiconductors where we can alter their uh, conductivity um, as we please. So we really wanted to see, can we take and tune the biofilm conductivity by controlling the doping of different charge carriers? And uh, by charge carriers, I mean these multi-heme cytochromes that really enable this process. So we're gonna switch gears a little bit in how these measurements are being made. Um, but so here, what I'm showing you is a cyclic voltammogram where we're having lactate serve as an electron source. So you get this catalytic wave, as we call it, where there's lactate oxidation happening at these more positive potentials. And so this is what the wild type Shiwanella looks like. But if you take Shiwanella and remove all of the multi-heme cytochromes from its genome, which is a strain we got from Jeff Gralnick's group at University of Minnesota, um, you get a complete repression in this catalytic current that you get from lactate oxidation. So this shows that you can really limit the ability for these cells to perform extracellular electron transport. And then we wanted to see, can we actually tune this and have it come back? So what we did is we added in a simple plasmid for controlling uh, the expression of the MTRC A and B conduit. Um, and this is under control of vanillic acid here. So when we take this strain that has this plasmid and grow it on an electrode without vanillic acid, it looks just like the knockout strain does. And then as you increase that vanillic acid concentration, you can get this phenotype to shift back to the wild type. So you can really re-enable this extracellular electron transport. 
So this was great. It shows that we can tune the quantity of cytochromes inside the outer membrane of these cells. Now we wanted to just check how does this influence the actual conductivity of that biofilm. So if you take that same biofilm without vanillic acid for this inducible strain and measure the conductivity just like we were before, where we're applying, in this case, a 20 millivolt offset between our source and drain electrode, you get a trace that looks like this with a relatively low amount of conduction current coming out of it. But then again, as we increase the vanillic acid concentrations, you get an increase in that conduction current that's flowing out of the biofilm until it ultimately hits a plateau. Um, and so we took these different peak conduct uh, conduction values, and then we again calculated the conductivity of this biofilm. Uh, so we took that same system of equations that we used earlier for doing this. We're using slightly different geometry electrodes here. So we have half the distance between the electrodes rather than the 30 microns, it's 15. Um, but as you can see here, we can actually tune the conductivity of this living uh, conductor um, between about zero and six nanosiemens per centimeter, dependent on the amount of vanillic acid that we're exposing to these cells. Um, so this just shows that we really can build programmable conductive living electronic materials out of bacterial biofilms, where we can both tune their spatial arrangement as well as how conductive these materials are. Uh, so now we're going forward and trying to build some actual devices where these uh, the ability to tune this conductivity will be useful. Um, and that's what I've been working on the last few weeks. Um, but now I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about some work from my PhD studies. Uh, so we're going to shift instead of talking about living materials to living electronic sensors. Um, and so the goal here was really to see can we engineer bacteria to convert chemical information directly into electronic signals without the need to produce some visual cue like we would normally do as synthetic biologists, we would produce a molecule like GFP or a fluorescent RNA or a gas producing protein. We wanted to see, could we just produce electrons out as an electrode as our signal? And the reason we wanted to do this is because biology is especially good at discriminating different chemicals out in their environment because cells need to be able to sense what's going on in their environment, respond to that, change how their metabolism is functioning, um, and adapt readily. We wanted to do this so that we could actually take these uh, living electronic sensors and put them out into deployable devices that we could leave out in the environment that wouldn't take a lot of energy to operate so we could monitor chemical contamination as well as other interesting chemicals we might uh, want to track out in the environment. Um, and so typically, as a synthetic biologist, uh, when I would say I want to go build a biosensor, the first thing I would think of is to build a gene circuit, right? To have an inducible promoter. These are highly modular systems. They work really well. Um, but there's some drawbacks to uh, transcriptional promoters as sensors, and that is the time scales at which they operate. Um, so when you use promoters to drive expression of an output protein, you have to wait for transcription and translation to occur inside of the cells. And this can happen on the order of tens of minutes to many hours, depending on the protein you're trying to express. So I wanted to try to build sensors that would respond very rapidly to chemicals that they encounter. So I want to see if we could take metabolism and use that directly as a sensor motif. So what I'm showing you here is uh, oxidative metabolism of glucose abstracted as an electrical circuit. So the electrical circuit that really describes what's going on with uh, oxidative metabolism is something known as a DC-DC power converter. So this is a circuit that takes electrons in at one potential and modulates them up to another potential. And so what I'm showing you here is the oxidative metabolism of glucose, where these low potential electrons are stripped off this glucose molecule as it processes through glycolysis. And then they're deposited onto a series of different electron carriers inside of the cells. These are things like the nicotinamides, NADH and NADPH, the flavins, the quinones. And then ultimately they get dumped off into a favorable electron sink, which oftentimes we think about as oxygen, as that's how our metabolism works. Um, but I wanted to see if it was possible to introduce a control element that can gate this flow of electrons through metabolism. And so what I've been showing you here for these electron carriers are small molecule chemicals, uh, which are somewhat challenging to engineer. They can be engineered by clever chemists, uh, but cells also use other types of electron carriers. And these are proteins, as I kind of alluded to earlier. Um, and life has evolved a wide range of different protein electron carriers that span the entire range of uh, midpoint potentials that are relevant to the chemistry of life. Um, so I talked earlier about those C-type cytochromes that are used in the outer membrane of electroactive bacteria, but, uh, which bind heme molecules, um, but there are also proteins that bind organic molecules like flavid, flavidoxins that bind flavins, 
things that bind uh, inorganic uh, metal clusters like these ferredoxins down here, which bind four iron and two iron to sulfur ferredoxins, as well as some like copper proteins that are up at these much higher potentials. And so when I started my PhD off, I really wanted to focus on metabolic engineering and how we can uh, build feedback systems into metabolic pathways using electron transfer. So the proteins that I chose to start working on were these two iron, two sulfur, and four iron, four sulfur ferredoxins. And that's because they have the lowest potential, which means they can perform most of, it, they can interact with the most different um, enzymes inside of the cell because of that low potential. They can really drive a lot of diverse chemistry with that. So I wanted to see, could we take these ferredoxins that are kind of static proteins that take an electron from a donor and give it off to an acceptor and turn them into something that's a bit more dynamic and responsive? So could we take a ferredoxin and engineer it such that in its native state, it's unable to transfer electrons, but when a chemical ligand shows up in its environment, it's able to turn on electron transfer and enable electron flow from this electron donor to an acceptor and use that to control metabolism inside of a cell. And so to do this, uh, the strategy that I took for building this protein switch was to do what we call as domain insertion, where we take a domain that is responsive to a ligand and insert it within the sequence of the functional protein, in this case, the ferredoxin. And so the domain that we initially uh, targeted towards using this was a nuclear hormone receptor domain. So specifically, we're taking the human estrogen receptors ligand binding domain and using that to try to control ferredoxin function. And so the reason why we chose this domain is it's fairly well understood and it undergoes really large conformational shifts when it binds its ligands. So in its APO state, these N and C termini are about 64 angstroms apart in space. But when it binds one of its chemical ligands, this red alpha helix here swings up and these N and C termini end up becoming quite close in space. And the other reason why we chose this domain is it responds to a different range of chemicals that would be very interesting to actually be able to monitor out in the environment. So these are things like therapeutic drugs like 4-hydroxytamoxifen, which have been used to treat cancers and have been found in water streams coming out of pharmaceutical plants, uh, as well as human metabolites like estradiol that are also can be found as contaminants in waterways, as well as interesting to monitor in the human body itself. And then also things like environmental contaminants. So these are like endocrine disruptors like bisphenol A, as well as the many other plasticizers that are used in place of bisphenol A. Um, so this made this a really attractive uh, uh, domain to try to insert into the ferredoxin because it has very interesting inputs. So in order to figure out the location in which you can successfully control ferredoxin activity, we took a combinatorial approach to designing this. So what we did is we took that sequence that encodes this estrogen ligand binding domain, and we inserted it throughout the entire coding sequence of this ferredoxin protein. And we did this using what we call transposon mediated domain insertion, where we made a synthetic transposon that's capable of inserting throughout this entire plasmid, and then ultimately replacing this transposon with just this estrogen ligand binding domain so that we get this library of proteins that have the ligand binding domain inserted at every different position within that protein that we could. And then to discover functional variants of this, what we used was a directed evolution approach to try to find proteins that were actually functional, as many of these protein uh, variants are non-functional. And so the way that we did this is that we took an oxytrophic strain of E. coli, uh, where its sulfite reductase had been removed, and we got this strain from Pam Silver's lab, actually. And we replaced uh, this sulfite reductase with a ferredoxin-dependent pathway. So we have a ferredoxin NADPH reductase that we got from corn that takes electrons from NADPH and donates them to the ferredoxin. And then the ferredoxin donates these electrons to that sulfite reductase that can uh, reduce sulfite to sulfide. And then what we do is we transform these cells with that library of protein variants, and we plate them onto selective media that contains one of these estrogen uh, binding estrogen ligand binding chemicals. Um, and so in this case, we use 4-hydroxytamoxifen as the molecule to try to turn on activity of these uh, mutant proteins. And then we selected different colonies off of these plates and screened them for their response to this 4-hydroxytamoxifen chemical. And this was work that I did with a master student, Bing Yan Wu, and, and Joff's group. Um, and so what I'm showing you here is the growth of these cells with different concentrations of 4-hydroxytamoxifen. So our wild type ferredoxin is this uh, black uh, circle trace at the top here. And as you can see, it's non-responsive to the different concentrations of 4-hydroxytamoxifen. Um, and then down here at the bottom is a negative control where we've knocked out the ability of this ferredoxin to bind its iron sulfur cluster, that cofactor that really facilitates electron transport. 
or transfer in this case. Um, and then all of these open symbols here represent different mutants that we selected off of these plates. So as you can see, these different mutants respond to 4-hydroxytamoxifen in different ways. They have different sensitivities and they have different total activity that you can get out as you induce them. So the best candidate protein that we have from here are these diamond ones here, which correspond to an insertion of the estrogen ligand binding domain after amino acid 55 within the ferredoxin. As you can see here, it can go from a fully off state to a state that's just like the wild type ferredoxin as we increase that concentration of 4-hydroxytamoxifen in our media. So this really shows that you can build ligand responsive electron transfer proteins by using combinatorial design and directed evolution to discover variants that have these new functions. So the next thing I wanted to do was see, can we actually build a sensor that can directly produce electrons as its output? In this case, what we're doing is we're controlling the production of sulfide and cell growth. Instead, we wanted to see, can we see and use an anode to monitor the flow of electrons through this metabolic pathway? And this is where uh, I turned to collaborating with Carolyn Ahu Franklin's group. So this was actually from a uh, 2016 meeting of SEED, uh, that conference. I had a poster next to one of Carolyn's postdocs at the time who was uh, inserting these um, multi-heme cytochromes from Shuanella into the E. coli genome and trying to get uh, E. coli to produce currents while I was building these electron transfer switches. And that's what really spawned this idea. Um, but Carolyn's group, um, what they've done is they were able to actually make E. coli that could produce uh, appreciable amounts of current uh, when they were expressing these multi-heme cytochromes. So I, uh, we reached out to Carolyn to see if we could collaborate, and uh, I went to the molecular foundry to work with Carolyn's group to try to take this pathway and insert it into the E. coli strain I was using to engineer ferredoxin proteins. So the first thing that we did was we took uh, an operon for expressing these multi-heme cytochromes, and we integrated that into the genome of the strain that I was working with. Um, and we had this under simple control of an uh, IPTG inducible promoter so that we could titrate the concentration of these cytochromes in these cells. Um, and then we used a colorimetric assay to just monitor and optimize for cytochrome expression. And that's because these multi-heme cytochromes turn these cells a nice red color when they uh, are binding their hemes successfully. So as you can see here, our wild type strain is unable to change color in response to IPTG, while our strain with that MTR pathway in its genome is able to produce uh, more and more red color in this case, which are indi indicative of more and more cytochromes in the cell. Um, so we took this kind of optimal uh, induction condition here for producing cytochromes, and we wanted to test how these actually perform in bioelectrochemical systems. So we took this engineered strain, we put it into a uh, bioelectrochemical system where we had cells exposed to an anode where we could mon monitor electrons flowing out of the cells from the oxidation of a substrate in the media. And so what we did is we fed these cells lactate, just like we would do with Chiwanella, um, and then monitored the current that was flowing out of them. So if you take your wild type E. coli strain, you get this small amount of current, about 10 milliamps per meter squared. Um, and then the cells that are producing that MTR cytochrome conduit are able to produce about twofold more current. Um, so this shows that this multi-heme cytochrome conduit is truly functional inside of these cells and can enable increased rates of extracellular electron transport in these cells. So, so far, I've told you about a pathway that can respond to chemicals and produce sulfide, and then a pathway where we're able to produce a direct electron output out of these cells at an electrode that uses quinols as an input, but we needed a way to try to link these two pathways together. Uh, so we turned to from natural organisms, and there are plenty of sulfide oxidizing organisms that exist out in the environment. And what they, some of them do is they oxidize sulfide to elemental sulfur using what's known as a sulfide quinone reductase that then directly reduces a quinone to a quinol that can feed into this MTR pathway. So we next wanted to evaluate, can we use one of these SQRs as a coupling module to connect our input chemical sensing ferredoxins to these output uh, multi-heme cytochromes? So the first thing we did was take the strain and tested its ability to oxidize sulfide. So our native strain that does not have a sulfide quinone reductase, when you put it in media and expose it to about 500 micromolar sulfide, it's unable to oxidize or remove that sulfide from the media. Um, however, when you introduce a sulfide quinone reductase to the strain, you're able to get complete oxidation of the sulfide uh, on the order of about five minutes or so. Um, so this shows you can functionally express a sulfide quinone reductase in E. coli um, and get it to oxidize sulfide. So now we can see that we're able to produce sulfide on demand, we're able to oxidize sulfide, and we're able to produce electrons using uh, and monitoring them with an electrode. We needed to take these three different components and put them together all in a single strain so we could have this one full metabolic pathway working. 
So this took a little bit of genetic engineering to get all of these components together in the same cell. So we had that strain where we have the cytochromes on the genome, and then we added a plasmid for titrating ferrodox in expression, as well as a plasmid for expressing our electron donor and acceptor, as well as the sulfide quinone reductase, and some maturation proteins that are essential for producing these multi-heme cytochromes. So we got all of this DNA into our host strain, and then we wanted to test, can we monitor ferrodoxin metabolism directly using an electrode? And so if we take a ferrodoxin that's not functional and replace our functional ferrodoxin with it and expose it to a variety of different concentrations of thiosulfate in this case, which is our sulfur molecule that we're trying to monitor, um, it's not responsive to thiosulfate. But if we replace that with our functional ferrodoxin, you can get this large increase in current that's coming out of these cells. Um, so this shows that you can use this MTR pathway and electrode to directly monitor ferrodoxin metabolism. And we wanted to see how fast do we actually, are we able to discriminate between these two strains? So we looked at our significant detection time between these two strains. And as you can see here, for these higher concentrations of thiosulfate, we're able to get significant detection within about three minutes time. And even at this lower concentration, we're still getting response times on the order of about 10 minutes. So now we wanted to see, can we take those sensors that we built earlier and try to replace our ferrodoxin with those to turn this into a sort of platform strain for monitoring uh, different chemicals uh, using electrodes. And we did this by using ratiometric sensing. So we took a control strain that's unable to respond to chemicals, um, as well as a sensing strain that can respond to chemicals and compared the electrons flowing out of each of these strains. And the reason why we do this is there can be a lot of abiotic effects like changes in temperature or substrate concentration that can lead to differences in current. So this helps you eliminate those kind of contaminating artifacts and only monitor the chemicals that are being introduced. And the way that we got both of these strains in the same bottle was to do to encapsulate them onto our working electrodes using calcium alginate gels that we were then wrapped in agarose. And as you can see here, when we have these two strains in the same bottle and expose them to our carrier chemical, in this case, DMSO, the, uh, the sensing strain is not responsive relative to the control strain as you would want it to be. Um, and then at, when you introduce 4-hydroxytamoxifen, one of these chemicals that turns on that ligand binding domain, you get this about three to 4% increase in the signal coming out of our sensing strain relative to our control strain. So this really shows that you can replace uh, our fully functional ferrodoxin with a ligand gated ferrodoxin and monitor different ligands other than the thiosulfate that is a substrate for this pathway. And again, we wanted to check the detection time for this sensor relative to um, our other sensor. And as you can see here, in about 7.8, eight minutes or so, we're able to get 95% confidence in uh, calling that this, these cells were exposed to 4-hydroxytamoxifen. And so the final thing we wanted to do with this was to actually see if this bio living electronic sensor can be used in more complex environments than a lab media. Uh, so Lynn and Xu, who I showed earlier on the slides, went out in Houston and collected water from different waterways. So these are from these bayous that flow through the center part of Houston, as well as from the, uh, the Gulf in Galveston and got some marine uh, waters. And so when you take these different complex waters as your analyte and place these electrochemical sensors in them, expose them to DMSO, again, you don't get any response of the sensing strain relative to the control strain. However, when you add 4-hydroxytamoxifen, these sensors are able to start producing current relative to this, uh, the control strain and tell you that these chemicals are actually in these complex water mixtures. So this really shows that we can take these living electronic sensors and try to use them in much more complex environments than just a lab. And with that, I would like to wrap up the talk uh, just acknowledging uh, Moe's lab, who I'm working with now here at USC, and uh, Marco and Christina, who are really pivotal to this work, as well as our collaborators, Fengji, James, and Jeff Gralnick. Um, as well as thanking the Silberg Lab where I did my PhD um, and all of these bold folks here were involved in our uh, sensor work, um, as well as our collaborators, uh, Carolyn Aho Franklin, Lin Su, Xu Zhang, and George Bennett. And Lin was really great. He got me started on electrochemistry. Um, and with that, uh, I want to just end the talk and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thanks. Wonderful. Thank you. So fantastic. So especially I love how you did start collaboration with Caroline at SID conference during the post session, because I believe, I mean, nowadays we should collaborate to solve many global problems like climate crisis. I mean, without just collaborating, it's impossible to solve. And I would say, or quote from African proverbs I love, to go faster, uh, go alone, but to go far, go together. 
So that's wonderful. So Linda, do you have any challenging question or comment? I was just going to ask a quick question about the last results, Josh, that you showed. Um, were you able to detect any of the tamoxifen in the waters you sampled, or did you have to add it exogenously? Yeah, so in, in these measurements, we were adding it exogenously. Um, so it's somewhat difficult, I guess, to discern our starting concentration of these endocrine disruptors. We're going to have a baseline current that's coming out of these cells, and then we're increasing that concentration relative. Um, so I think the idea for how these sensors would be deployed in the environment is they're out in the environment, they're deployed for a period of time so you can assess a baseline current that's coming out of them, and then monitor for any upticks in this case of things that will trigger the estrogen ligand binding domain. And if I can ask another question, are you thinking about any other um, ligand binding proteins? So that's the sort of the front end of your sensor. Are you thinking about other classes of proteins where you think this approach may work that would let you get at even a greater number and greater diversity of uh, targets? Definitely. I know that's ongoing work in Joff and Caroline's group. I think they had a subsequent ONR grant that was related to try to sense multiple different ligands and have outputs for them. Um, and so, yeah, uh, I so previously when we built these ferrodoxin switches, I was only the telling the story about this estrogen ligand mining domain, but we have inserted other domains within this ferrodoxin to respond to different chemicals. So we use another model system, which is a two protein system where they're split apart to respond to rapamycin. It's a very common model system. Um, but I know there's interest in trying to take other their single ligand mining domains and insert them within the sequence um, and try to really use this as a platform and not just respond to one chemical. Yeah, I guess I think about some of the two component. There's so yeah. many of the two yeah, component yeah. sensing so I, systems. There's a ton of power to try to couple these to two component systems, which have evolved to really, the microbes have done a great job of trying to respond to all of these different chemicals. And a lot of those are dimerization based. Um, so, yeah. I'm going to mute myself. I'm sure other people have questions for you. Yeah, so I already I have question, but I want to entertain the audience question first. So from anonymous kind of attendee, uh, I believe this is uh, around around the biocontainment. So I will read this one. So per benefit of using whole cells as sensors instead of genetic switches, and also probably do not want to release synthetic genetic tools into the environment. I'm not sure what scarly cells means, but scarly cells seem less concerned for unintended consequences, especially if fragile, away from example, for example, of preferred nutrient. And then uh, actually there's no question, but I guess, I mean, this person wanted to have your comment about uh, biocontainment, I guess. Yeah, I can talk about that. So the reason why we started off going down building whole cell biosensors is because they're more robust to fouling out in the environment. So we could directly deposit this, you know, electron transfer protein that function as a switch onto an electrode. Um, but uh, it, it's challenging to maintain a close contact with the electrode over time and not have that protein degrade over time. So the nice thing that cells offer is a way to, you know, self-replicate, produce more of these proteins as they're deployed out in the environment for longer and actually maintain themselves. So that was really why we went down the whole cell avenue. Um, I completely agree on putting things in the genome for increasing stability. Um, and so that's partly why uh, we actually pursued putting the MTR pathway in the genome in this case. Because um, previous efforts, they were always on plasmids, and we're having issues trying to maintain all of those inside of the cell. Um, yeah. Um, and, but okay, and so when we're doing these encapsulation approaches. One of the goals there is to really keep the cell encapsulated on the electrode and not released. So these kind of early systems we built, we wrap them in agarose, but you can wrap them in uh, silicon dioxide type materials that are better at actually functioning as sieves and keeping cells in and letting molecules still flow. Um, and so previous sensor work in Carolyn's group kind of took that approach to try to build ones where the cells wouldn't leak out into the environment, because that really is a challenge in trying to deploy these things. I okay. think in your description, you double wrapped your cells, right? Because you have, they're embedded in <laughs> alginate. Um, and I don't know, do you have any inorganic like graphene or other mm -hmm. nanoparticles in there to increase your... Yes, so I did gloss over that a little bit. So our early sensors, when we started doing encapsulation initially, were just calcium alginate wrapped in agarose. The agarose is just used to hold and keep that gel there stably. Um, but when we were building these 4-hydroxy tamoxifen sensors, we incorporated um, 
some titanium di uh, titanium nanoparticles in there alongside of that to increase kind of the electrode surface area because we were having issues basically where there wasn't quite enough signal coming out of the cells when we were doing this calcium alginate and encapsulation. It can impede their ability to actually come in contact with the electrode, which is essential for getting electron transfer. And adding those nanoparticles really boosts the current that you get out of these cells. And so that was work that came from actually, I think, Lynn's PhD was starting to interface cells with these types of titanium nanoparticles. So it was really a, uh, you know, working with a material scientist background uh, was really nice from a collaboration perspective there. Wonderful. So uh, while waiting, I will ask questions. So, so my question is as following, as in the following. Uh, so as I said earlier, I want to have my electronic <laughs> device powered by electricity generated by bacteria for sustainable or long lasting battery. The vision is, in fact, my cell phone died multiple times during my 10 weeks of seminar trip uh, and I got lost multiple times in Europe and, and uh, you know, other you know, country because I did not have access to Google Maps. Also, I did not use taxi or public transportation, but I used my legs and phone. I just walking around one hour, two hours, three hours, whenever I wanted to walk. So could you kind of give some perspective to implement or achieve my dream, uh, focusing on remaining challenges and opportunities in this field? Sure, yeah, I, uh, or did Linda want to comment? Um, I was going to ask if you wanted to, I certainly can, but I'll let you, I'll let you have first crack at that one. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, so I don't know if you noticed going throughout this, the amount of current that is flowing out of these cells is relatively low or on nanoamp scales here. Um, there has been a long history in the microbial fuel cell world of trying to use this as a renewable energy source. Mm -hmm. um, and there has been uh, large advances that have happened in there that kind of come more from the electrochemical systems perspective than necessarily enhancing the biology itself for producing more current. Um, so one group that's really great to look at in that space is Bruce Logan at Penn State University. Uh -huh. They've really made some huge impacts over the last few years of just changing the material that they're using as a exchange membrane in their fuel cells and increasing uh -huh. amounts of current. But really, it comes down to being able to increase the scale of your electrode. That's where you become challenged in producing sufficient amount of energy to drive a car or power a phone, for example. These are really kind of somewhat higher energy use cases. Um, but it can definitely be used to power low energy electronics. So you uh -huh. want to deploy a sensor on the bottom of the ocean. There's been some very cool work in benthic microbial fuel cells that use natural microbes to power low powered sensors. So what they do there is they stick an electrode down in the sediment. Microbes come and oxidize their substrates on that electrode. And there's another electrode in the sub the water above that sediment that is then reducing um, oxygen. Um, and you're able to get enough current flow there to actually power these low powered sensors and leave them out in the environment for a really long time. Because one of the big challenges, if you have things deployed in the bottom of the ocean, is changing the batteries to power your thing. Uh -huh. um, that's a significant amount of work for divers. Yeah. So uh, that I means, I mean, actually, I, I, I enjoy. Do. Yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. So that means I enjoy for the first time snorkeling uh, in Cancun. That means I could do that using your bacteria uh, battery someday. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Linda, do you have any comment or any other thing to add? No, I mean, um, some of the benthic work that Josh mentioned is stuff we were really interested in ONR. And then he also mentioned uh, Bruce Logan and others who have been looking at wastewater and, and trying to, um, in some cases, just having um, a treatment system become more energy neutral. Uh -huh. um, you know, maybe you're not generating energy to power an electric grid, but if you could reduce the amount of power that the running of a system takes, that can be uh, a big gain. So uh -huh. in addition to directly powering devices, which is challenging because the um, the current that comes out of these systems can be can fluctuate. Uh -huh. um, a lot of folks have looked at you know supercapacitors and you know other ways to sort of trickle charge rechargeable mm -hmm. systems. That that seems to be an effective um, an effective strategy. I, I got it. So I'm not expert in this area. So I just have random dreams. So okay. <laughs> so thank you. So I have another question from Andre uh, Adams. So question is, assuming sequestering the bacteria works perfectly, the better you isolate the bacteria from the environment, the more isolated the sensor becomes from the analyte. 
how do you envision overcoming this limitation in the in future uh, iterations? Thanks for that great question, Andre, because that's actually another nuance I didn't really talk about. So uh, we were making, uh, we we're quite talking quite a bit about our response times of these sensors. And right now, the key limitation of these sensors is mass transport through our calcium alginate gel. So that's what leads us to this kind of two to 10 minute response time. Uh, so I didn't show any of these data before, but we've actually taken these ferrodoxins and put them onto electron or electrodes and monitored uh, them switching on, and they operate at faster timescales than what we're getting out of these whole cell sensors. So I think one thing that will always be a challenge with trying to build one of these uh, encapsulated sensors is trying to minimize the size of this encapsulating layer while still having sufficient integrity to keep your cells close to your electrode and out of the environment. Um, yeah. Okay, so let me check. One more time, whether we have additional question. Uh, I do not see from Q&A, no in the chat. Linda, do you have any question? Uh, you could ask one last one. Oh, I have another. Oh, thanks. That's the, this, I think, okay. Do you have any, another question or comment? Uh, no, I can, I can hold for now. Okay, so in that case, I mean, I will close because now it's perpetual timing because now 11 o'clock my time. Okay, so thanks all for joining and staying today, especially during the vacation weeks. And we will meet again next week on August 18th, Thursday, the same time, the same Zoom link. We'll have Professor Mustafa Kamashi from ETH Jewish. Uh, and the probably closer to you know the Denmark you're going to, and Dr. Ross Jones from University of British Columbia, so you know Canada. So as usual, uh, the follow informal chat will occur without recording, and please stay here if you are interested in chatting with today's speakers, and I will promote you to panelists who can speak and show your handsome and pretty face. So thanks, I will stop recording. Okay, let me stop. And that way we can eat, you know, pretty talk.